Hey, everyone. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, so thank you for coming to Dr. Andrea Grover's second Distinguished Ecology talk. Um, Dr. Grover is an associate professor of information science and technology at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and she conducts cutting edge research at the intersection of science, technology, and public engagement. Um, through her interdisciplinary work, she's written papers and given talks as topics as diverse as big data, citizen science, ecology, astrophysics, health, and a lot more. Um, She's an associate editor for Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment and has reviewed papers in journals as diverse as Trends in Ecology and Evolution, the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association, and the Journal of Science Communication. Um, before coming to the University of Nebraska Omaha, she was an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, where this is my favorite part of her CV. She received the Masters of Information Management Student Association Sheer Awesomeness Award. <laughs> um, <clears throat> She received her PhD from Syracuse University in Information Science and Technology in 2012, where she was awarded the All University Doctoral Dissertation Prize, and she received a Master's of Science in Information at the University of Michigan, and a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics at um, Alma College in Michigan. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrea Grover, who will speak to us today about the secret life of observational data, searching for signs of citizen science volunteer skills. Well, thank you all for being here on a really lovely afternoon. I always expect lower um, attendance when the weather's nice. Um, and. Honestly, I like an intimate crowd, so that's fine with me. Um, so thanks for the lovely intro again. Today I'm talking about some research that I've been working on for, I would actually have to do a little math to count, several years now, because we've had multiple no-cost extensions uh, because COVID times. And um, this has been a really interesting foray for me into evaluation research, which is definitely a very specific specialty. And so our team for this work comes from ecology, from educational psychology um, and a range of other backgrounds that I haven't actually looked at their CVs to verify, but it's everybody comes from a different space, which means we're really thoughtful about how we communicate with one another, um, and hopefully that rubs off in the way I'm talking about the work today. So um, this talk is going to focus on how we worked with five citizen science projects to measure volunteer skills at observation and measurement. So we're literally doing research with researchers on how they do their research. Very meta, kind of my style. Um, and some of the questions I'm hoping to answer for you equate to motivation, background, methods, <laughs> results, and future work. Right, so there's more than one way to kind of put the standard outline up there. So let's start off with like why it matters. Citizen science is generally intended to be welcoming to a wide range of people from a wide range of backgrounds with a variety of skills, right? Um, and learning is often a goal um, for the people organizing the project, if not the participants, and it's also often seen as a benefit of participation for those who are involved, right? And inquiry skills in particular are kind of needed in science, but also in life more generally. So these all sound like great outcomes for people to um, achieve in participating in a project. However, their skills could certainly impact data quality. And this is one of the prime concerns that has led to some of us spending many years going on and on about data quality and how like it's kind of our responsibility to make sure it works out right. Um, but this was kind of thinking about, all right, can we actually measure what people's skills are at doing the work without driving them away. Um, and the hardest part of this has actually been talking with our project leaders about what skills actually are, right? Oh, that's okay, these things happen. You're all good. 
keeping it light, right? Um, so we have been um, working on this project called Streamline Embedded Assessment, um, which is uh, advancing informal science learning in the um, NSF world. And it centers on embedded assessment, which is assessments that fully integrate into a learning experience rather than being a separate activity. So an EA could be a game or something like that that's integrated into a project's design and results in some kind of artifact that you can use to understand skills or knowledge. So in this project, we are, have been working on two different strategies to look at streamlining the process of embedded assessment because it turns out to be like pretty effortful to put together, but the potential advantages are substantial. Um, and so uh, one of them is shared measures, and we've had several uh, colleagues working on that specifically, but the one I'm gonna talk about today is about reanalyzing data validation to look at volunteer skill gains. So it's essentially secondary analysis of your own primary data, right? So just to like, since evaluation is basically a completely new space to me, even though a lot of research could be framed as evaluation, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on this. So basically, it's a, it's a space that's pretty limited in citizen science. Most of the work in evaluation, and there's been plenty, and it's been funded, actually focuses on science attitudes and science identities. That really dominates the scene, partly because it's easy, honestly. It's not easy, easy, but it's easier than like content knowledge because the kind of content knowledge is like really varies, and how are you gonna get at that other than quizzing people? No adult who comes to you to do science for fun wants to take a quiz. Guarantee it, right? Um, and so science inquiry skills in particular, which as we've hopefully established, may have some bearing on data quality, are really under-evaluated, which is one of the reasons that we picked that as like the target for this work. We could have probably made things easier for ourselves, <laughs> um, but data validation for accuracy is like way more common. We're like, well, people are already doing this part of it. Can we like zhuzh it up a little bit to find out something about the volunteers and not just the things that they're reporting data on? Some of the reasons we don't do much evaluation is we don't actually have the expertise. A lot of the expertise for doing evaluation research comes out of psych and education, and those are fields that aren't terribly well represented in the citizen science practitioner community. We have a few wonderful folks who kind of work in those spaces, but they're not necessarily the ones running projects. They're getting paid decent money as consultants to help you evaluate so that you can actually get that grant. Um, we're also really, really worried that putting a quiz in front of people is gonna drive them away and that making it clear that we're not sure how good they are is going to further reduce people's self-efficacy and kind of cast doubt on the whole process when we really actually need to be supporting people's confidence in doing the work so that they can do it more effectively. So we figured embedded assessment's really worth exploring. It's authentic, it's unobtrusive, it's integrated into activities. If you've ever played a video game where the training is embedded in the initial chunk of that game, that's an embedded assessment style of doing a, a training, right? So imagine you're doing that kind of embedded style of assessing what people figured out from your training. So we had some inspiration in this. It was a paper that we got published in 2015 that I was on the team for when I was a postdoc at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It was probably the most fun paper I have worked in for a large chunk of time because we had a, a fantastic team of information science, social science, kind of behavior-minded people, along with bird experts and statistical modelers and the people who built the software. And so we actually had all of the elements that we needed to really pull some insights out of the data there. And so long story short, one of the things that we could see, this is like just one of the preliminary graphics that we generated along the way. This is like one person's species accumulation curves um, over time. And so instead of holding the person constant, we held the place and time constant, theoretical maximum on number of birds there. All right, so then the variation is the observer, right? And you get enough people going to the same location. You can actually establish this reasonably well. So as you can kind of see from this, my apologies for the fidelity here, um, the performance improved over time, like kind of just like we would hope it would. Um, and the thing that I love about this one in particular is that blue line that's the first year of this person's engagement in the project, they reported no zero count checklists. And after that, they started reporting zero count checklists, which is important because it's really hard to get volunteers to say, I didn't see anything. Really hard. Um, so this person, as far as I'm concerned, clearly learned something about the protocol and the science that was actually meaningful and valuable. And that alone is like, you can tell it from one graph, 
I was kind of blown away by that um, because it's such a struggle for so many projects. So this was kind of what my co-PIs brought as like, hey, you worked on this thing that we think we might be able to do in a broader context, right? And I was like, count me in. That sounds awesome. So we got a little over $1.2 million across all of this work, which is pretty good scratch, but my chunk was very small. And the question was really, can we replicate this process in other citizen science projects, at least for part of the work that we were doing? And so we thought about, well, how about some projects that use a nearly identical pro protocol to eBird, but with fishes, um, that do entirely online classification of large hadron collider glitches, which is fancy physics stuff, and this is a data cleaning thing. Um, that involve measuring dead seabird carcasses, yes, people volunteer to do that, that requires some stream water chemical analyses, and that features really scenic front range, um, hiking, and also pikas, which is very local here. Um, so, you know, I was the only one involved in the research who had attempted anything like it before, and we couldn't replicate the process through which we had done the prior work. It was like different team, different time, different stuff happening, right? So we basically kind of had to make things up as we went along, um, and that's science for you. And it was actually one of the goals of the work was figuring out what kind of processes can help make this work feasible. So our partner teams, were, we kind of guided them through a process of identifying which skills that there would be evidence for in the data assets that they have, prioritizing their options for doing a secondary analysis, actually doing that analysis, and using the evaluation results. And we had a pretty good chunk of change for them to um, compensate their um, project leadership and their analyst to make this feasible because we can't ask for their time without compensating them properly because this was not a small ask. Um, for our team, doing all the meta stuff, we did a bunch of interviews um, about the protocol and kind of like how their project works, um, how their progress was going, like what was challenging, what was going better than expected, and then you know, kind of what did they get out of it in the long run, and, and how did they use those results? Because evaluation use is really important. Why evaluate stuff if you're not actually gonna use the results? Um, and then we did, had some intermediate workshops to facilitate. A couple in person, luckily, before things went awry, and then one um, remotely. So we kind of walked people through this process to figure out what skills they could potentially do an analysis for. So we had them brainstorm all the science inquiry skills that they could think of that volunteers might apply in their project, and then ask them, is that actually a skill or a measure of a skill? And they're like, for reals, <laughs> what skill is that? Um, and then if yes, is it in your database? Do you have data on this thing? Um, and then, if yes, um, prioritize your options and pick a winner, something that you think is gonna really be worth the time that you're sinking into this. So I'll give you an example of the um, decision process for Gravity Spy, which was the entirely online um, project. It's a physics project on Zooniverse. So we started talking with our partners to identify the inquiry skills that might serve as variables for their secondary analysis. And so in that first conversation, they identified 11 kind of things that they thought um, might be useful and wanted to think about for their secondary analysis. So we looked closer, we poked at them a little bit, and eliminated one because it wasn't actually a skill. It was just like an event that can happen for some um, participants because it's got a leveling system where you kind of improve, increase difficulty over time. And if they weren't performing well after leveling up, they would, might get leveled down, but that's not a skill. That's kind of your own intervention for your data quality purposes, right? And then it turned out that three of them that were of interest um, didn't have data related to it already in their records. So we had to throw those out as well. They all have seven skills. Um, they prioritized it down to two. And then out of those two, they picked the one that was the starting place for their secondary analysis. So it's actually pretty easy for the projects to decide what skills were in their databases, which skills were not, and which ones they thought were gonna be most valuable to them to dig into further. The trickier piece was actually figuring out what counts as a skill in the first place. Was, I'll come back to it in just a second here. So I wanna give you a little introduction to these projects. I'll go into a little more detail later, but Gravity Spy picked accurate pattern recognition, and you can see that accurate data collection is really a theme in one way or another across all of these projects that we worked with. And in hindsight, we kind of think that we accidentally guided them in that direction by requiring that the secondary analysis should use data validation records. 
right? <laughs> um, and so we went through this detailed process on the prior slide to kind of like narrow things down which e with each of these projects, but it's um, kind of easy for us to forget that something as straightforward to say as collecting data is actually really complex. Um, so they had to break things down further to find things that we could actually measure. And so I actually came up with this visual as a way to help identify what skills are involved in participation, but it took some time for everyone to get it. So I had to do a lot of explaining, and I think it was mostly because the distinction between protocols and tasks and skills were not particularly well defined. It's like protocols is like what steps are there that you're telling people to follow, and tasks are what are those steps, and then the skills are what do they need to be able to do to succeed at those steps, right? So if we think about accurate data collection as a skill on the surface, we might think that we could just figure out what volunteers get right and what they get wrong, which is really important, but not that useful for evaluation because it doesn't tell you where things start to go wrong for people. And so laying things out this way and then analyzing data related to each piece lets you identify exactly where the things are not as you want them to be, which becomes your intervention point for providing new or different support to volunteers in some way. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what this looked like when our project partners kind of went through it. Um, so uh, Alarm is a water quality monitoring project in or group of projects actually uh, based in Pennsylvania. So their focus was uh, demonstrating that people know the protocol and are following instructions properly. And so they do shale gas extraction monitoring. Um, some of the key steps for them are, include, you know, metadata, chemical monitoring, and visual monitoring, which then break down to kind of these sub steps that people have to succeed at. Um, and for the Front Range PICA project, they wanted to check whether people were accurately navigating to the survey sites because the goal was to go to locations where PICA had been historically documented as you know, being present and evaluate whether they can find PICA there now. Um, so they have to navigate to the site, they have to conduct the survey at the right location, they have to document the survey location appropriately. And so some of these things are much easier to evaluate than others and the, using the GPS to navigate to within 200 meters of site coordinates actually was the one that was most concretely achievable for what they had in hand and were able to work with at the time. So, what these projects found on the overall is that it's definitely possible, but it's not always a reasonable venture. And it's really important to, sure that, uh, to ensure that costs and benefits are actually balanced. So, that's a piece of it that we're still working on finding way to, better ways to articulate. Um, but I want to share some of the specific findings from the analyses our partners did because it's kind of cool stuff. Um, and they found some really interesting little tidbits. So Front Range PICA project, their work was cut off before completion due to COVID. Um, they're a partner with the Denver Zoo, so a lot of their staff kind of got evaporated pretty quickly. But they found the entire process of thinking through how to evaluate skills and skill gains was really beneficial for them to think about how to get high quality data from going from solely focusing on QAQC to eliminate the bad data to thinking about volunteer skills. So putting thought into what skills are lacking or what are common mistakes and what might influence baseline skills and trajectories for improvement in skills and all that stuff that we spent a lot of time talking about together um, really uh, felt like a valuable effort to them. They highlighted ways they might be able to improve the amount and quality of data they got through training and volunteer feedback. So ultimately, they decided to redesign their volunteer intake forms to get records of some of the key details that were missing in their data to enable them to do stronger evaluation mo work moving forward. So even though we didn't quite get the nice um, shiny bow tie on it at the end, we thought that's a win. Um, that, that has set them up for a more successful future, and that's kind of, that's great, right? Then we go to reef. Reef involves volunteer divers in monitoring fishes on coral reefs. They have a literal boatload of data, maybe multiple boatloads of data. Um, so very different challenges from the Front Range PICA project. Um, their protocol is also the one that's most directly comparable to the eBird project, like to the point that when we were working on that paper with the eBird team, they speculated that Reef would be the project that could replicate the work that we were doing at the time. So all the things came around with that. So 10.2 million records <laughs> is a lot to wrangle, almost 30 years of data, right? Which is kind of a dream and a nightmare at the same time, it's like for reals. So, um, oh, of course, I got the visuals wrong. All right, so we helped them find a professional statistician because they didn't have internal capacity for that, and that really paid off. 
because we got a really good statistician for them to work with. And this is not my analysis, so please don't ask me about the stats. I, I will not be able to answer your questions. In fact, I'm using some of their description directly, so if it sounds good, it's because a trained ecologist who does statistical modeling wrote it up, all right? So across the surveys that were included in the analysis, the divers saw between zero and 160 species, the mean of 48, standard deviation of 22, most of the surveys were likely to be about an hour long, but it could range substantially, like um, really substantially, just as long as your oxygen tank is going to last, essentially. So they decided to normalize for dives of longer than 15 minutes, but no longer than three hours, which is important because being um, down for a survey for longer means you will see more species, right? So unsurprisingly, they focus their modeling on species accumulation curves, since it's a general relationship that can be modeled with a variety of statistical forms. And so this raw data here shows a positive but saturating relationship between species observed and bottom time, which we could fit with a bunch of different statistical models like a generalized additive model here. Um, so there's a lot of variation in the data around that curve. So like fits like, mm. and um, they went all out <laughs> to generate the most complex model possible to account for all the variation they could because um, we gave them the money to do this, so why not? Um, and they also recognize the trade-off that complex models are more computationally intensive and take much longer to run on the computer, plus the sheer volume of data actually limited their ability to use some, some models. There was just so much of it. And this was after they broke it down regionally, um, so they were, they were looking at eight different regions, I think, uh, for where these dives occur. So it's pretty intensive. Um, so this is the actual model <laughs> that they developed, and it hands down the most analytically complex work any of our teams did. Um, they had a goal of publishing a paper on this, but due to some of the other uh, upheavals in 2020, not just the pandemic, it got pushed off track a bit. Um, but they did some impressive work on the analysis, and bottom line, their models worked. And it showed that people learn at different rates, and some folks even lost proficiency over time, which is actually kind of consistent with what we know about humans. Um, and so I've highlighted one of the terms here, group size, because it re represents like a programmatic covariate that they were really interested in. So when divers start doing reef protocols, there are at least two models for their initial participation. There's solo dives and there's group dives. So we all expected that the divers whose initial introduction to participation was in a group setting would see the improvement fastest. But we needed to assess that empirically to actually you know, have any utility for program management and primary data analyses, because you can use some of these results to augment your analysis of the ecology data. So it kind of goes both ways. And they were still working on that part of the analysis as we were doing the final wrap-up interview with them. Um, but they had indeed found a positive relationship between group size and species detected, which is also basically exactly what we would expect based on what has been observed with birders as well. So it's really kind of cool to see some consistency in how humans perform with different taxa and different settings, but a very similar protocol. So we felt pretty good about that one. And it, all of that equation, it's just like, yeah, that's, that's about as good as it gets for me. Okay, so back to alarm. Um, they have shale gas volunteers monitoring for potential fracking impacts. Um, some years ago, there was a lot of concern about fracking in upstate New York and Pennsylvania. And so they started monitoring before any of the fracking got going and kept monitoring as time went on. And they were looking for pollution events on small streams. And on the other hand, like they went to the other direction with a simpler and smaller scale analysis. They wanted to learn whether passing their required split sample testing for accuracy had any bearing on the completeness of the data that were submitted. So you were able to do the like sampling successfully. You got a result. We trust it. Did you actually do the whole thing, right? Um, and then also considered whether engagement with program staff impacted completeness as well. So all the follow-up work, all of the volunteer management effort that they were pouring into these volunteers, was it paying off? So they pulled their data. They actually digitized manual records of trainings and follow-up contacts. And ultimately, their evaluation showed that the project wasn't accomplishing the goals they had set. So they ended up shuttering the program. And that's not the storybook ending that you know, we might want to see. We still think it's a win because it informed an important decision about how to use limited resources for maximum impact. And they were extremely enthusiastic about what they got out of participating in the work. So I think it was really actually a very good outcome on the overall. It was kind of most of the volunteers were involved 
because they were worried and they wanted to socialize with other people who were worried as well. But the science was really secondary to them and that just wasn't quite accomplishing what Alarm wanted to see happening. So Coast is the one with the dead seabirds. Um, so the volunteers identify and document seabird carcasses and they wanted to look at volunteers' accuracy with identification of the birds. And because the birds are decaying, there's less and less information to use to identify them over time. Right, so there's a whole lot of tasks that they have to do in concert um, for an identification to be verified as accurate or inaccurate. They have the Charlie factor. Charlie does all of their verification. Charlie is a whiz at identification, like super, super good. Um, so that person is one of those super volunteers. And the table's incomplete here, but it gives you kind of a feel for it. So two of the important steps are photographing the carcass and then um, making some body measurements. And the volunteer makes those measurements um, depending on which parts of the carcass are still available and then uses that evidence to help make the identification. So these body measurements were the primary focus of their analysis and Coast encountered the fewest challenges of any of our teams because in many ways their systems and organizational capabilities were already really optimized for doing this kind of work. They had an amazing postdoc on staff who was really, really good at analysis. They have done a lot of evaluation work over the years, so they're on board with kind of the mentality, and they have worked real hard on like keeping their data in really good shape over time. And like a pretty comprehensive data set, um, including details that most programs aren't tracking. Um, so across the population, the wing and bill measurement accuracy really doesn't change much with experience, but tarsus measurement accuracy does actually slowly increase with experience. The really cool thing, though, was that the results suggested that coasters take more care with the carcasses when they're in worse shape. So they're relying on other cues for ID when the bodies are more intact, but when push comes to shove and it's really necessary for the ID, they will exactly follow the protocol and be much more careful with their measurements, which they found very entertaining because they really strictly instruct their volunteers to measure all the things and use that for the ID. And obviously people aren't doing that all the time because this is how people behave, right? But now they have a lot of information that they could kind of, um, think about leveraging as they're doing their training around this. They also estimated that they could see a 0.1% improvement in data quality if they aggressively addressed this. And for them, it wasn't worth it because updating training materials is expensive. They have exquisite training materials that are very carefully developed. And so like that level of investment for such a small gain doesn't make sense for them. But now they know with confidence exactly how this thing works and it's like one more thing they can check off. Yep, we have optimized this piece. So overall, I'm gonna give you an overview of some of our surprises that led to the key results that I'm gonna go into momentarily. And along with these points, I'm gonna share some of their experiences with you in their own words. So everybody reported getting so much out of this in, in a range of ways, and some of them we really didn't expect. In particular, the kind of collaborated, uh, cl excuse me, collaborative process that we were going through with them was something they really appreciated, and and every like literally everybody involved was really happy with that part. And we weren't quite sure why, because it wasn't necessary for them to actually do this work. We also they also just didn't do some stuff that we kind of thought or assumed that they would. So mostly they ignored participant demographics because as they very quickly pointed out, there's nothing actionable about, about that. You can't make people younger. You can't make them like have another degree under their belt. You know, All of those kinds of things actually aren't that meaningful. They also didn't really explore those learning trajectories like I showed with the initial eBird results because again, that wasn't something they saw as being particularly actionable. That's just how much one person might improve with some practice. Right? And so kind of what it tells you is like you could weight data from different individuals if you want to for your analyses, that would be possible, but that wasn't the evaluation they were looking for. Um, and then they also really actually found the process useful for evaluating skills, but the secondary data alone was not enough. Every single project added in additional data about participation or context in some fashion. So you couldn't just do it with your validated data. 
So some of the benefits um, were kind of interesting to hear them talk about. So this project leader really called out the value of the reflective practice that we just don't always cultivate in our own work and how that had really reshaped their understanding of evaluation and how projects can grow and evolve. And I could not have paid them enough for this last line. Um, although they clearly felt that they benefited from working with us, I suspect that a lot of that was actually attributable to the reflection that was required throughout this entire process. You had to really think deeply about how things were being done for your analysis to mean anything. So the kind of key results that will hopefully be forthcoming whenever the manuscript review is completed, I'm giving you the high level overview here. Um, a lot of the decisions that they made in the process of analysis were really guided by how accessible their data were and what they planned to do with the results. So very practical in the focus. Um, they wanted to support changes to their own programs and optimize how they're running their projects. And they also opted for things that they felt had potential impact for the field of citizen science. So these very communitarian minded folks. When it's I'm talking about like available data, some of them had filing cabinets full of data sheets, um, but available data from a practical standpoint basically meant ready to use data. They definitely did some heavy lifts on the data prep though. And that was one of the major challenges. Anybody not think data prep is a lot of work? All right, you're all very experienced with this sort of thing. It's like, I always tell the students in my analytics class, it's gonna be 90% of your work is just getting that data into shape to do an analysis in the first place. Right? And so we expected this to be a lot of work, um, but it really kind of drove it home to see how they worked through that. And then sample size really matters at both extremes. We deliberately chose projects that were a range of sizes, a range of ages, a range of participation styles, because we felt like we would get more insight out of that. So we had the 10.2 million records. We also had maybe a few thousand records, right? Um, we had projects that were hmm, three, four years old and projects that were almost 30 years old. So we really had a lot of variation there to try to understand what was going to be a make or break factor in their success in going through this process. So with data accessibility, um, one of the projects was like, well, you know, we have all the source data that isn't in the database and somebody could actually pull them out of these enormous filing cabinets and kind of fill in the blanks of the database. It was definitely possible, but it would be so much work. We couldn't pay them enough for that. Like, it, it, it just was out of scope because it would have also taken so much time. So they chose not to pursue some of the things they might otherwise have gone for just because this was not a practical thing to get into. And the accessibility of the data was definitely not a, like an isolated issue for this particular team. So like Reef, with the group participation and solo participation models, that was not in their data set. They had to derive it. So to derive that, they had to look at where there are other people submitting data at the same time and place. So basically doing a bunch of record matching over 10 million records and adding a column saying, is this group or solo? Which is a little, that's a lot. <laughs> um, I would not sick my students on that. Um, but there were also some other kind of limitations that they ran into with secondary data. So they had some really interesting observations on how the technology has been developed to prevent errors on the volunteers part, but in the process, it actually erases the evidence of errors and therefore learning. And this was independently like an issue for two of the projects. So we don't capture the error state when people go and fix things, we just, like all the form field correction stuff that is actually best practice, so you get the cleanest data you can. Um, if they make an error and the, and the form's like, nope, fix that, we don't know that that happened. So we don't know how many times people ran into an error before they could just whiz through it with no problems. And so that was a thing that we felt like, well, it would be cool and valuable to like look at that, but mm, it's not so feasible, right? And it turns out, of course, that doing any kind of updates to data capture on the infrastructure is like nigh unto impossible in terms of the cost and um, the effort involved. And so it really would have to pay off for it to be worth it for them to do that. Of course, we all know data prep takes some work. Um, and this one is what we expected to be the case, but seeing it played out like this was just really wild. So they had done a brilliant job of their primary data. But 
anything like how many trainings a volunteer attended or um, how many kind of outreach events they participated in. They had some stuff on that, but it was not in good shape. We had multiple projects that actually had to go to like dig out a notebook somewhere that an undergrad several seasons ago had stashed in a corner and then do a bunch of tippy typing to get it into a spreadsheet that we could actually use. Um, and so a couple of projects actually went back to hard copy, but those were the smaller ones um, where it was feasible for them to do that. And I suspect they might have in some cases done it after they had already pre-filtered for are there like repeat observations and things like that that we can look at for change. This is a lot of work to ask for people. Um, most projects, like this is absolutely a deal breaker, right? They, we would not do this. However, it is something that we can use going forward in terms of like, well, what should we be capturing up front? What should we be designing our systems to log? What should we be storing about our volunteers and how they're engaging so that we can actually do a cool analysis like this in a year or two years or three years, right? So with sample sizes, I mentioned both extremes <laughs> impose some limitations as well. And so the ginormous database, they actually had months of delays because it was so difficult to extract exactly the right data, but not too much, and then actually ship it from, is that San Diego to Portland? Like, the internet tubes are not big enough for data like that, interestingly. So it was a real challenge that they had to try multiple ways to work through. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, they ended up looking at can people actually just do the thing as a point in time and not as an improvement with experience, right? Because they just didn't have enough people coming back in the limited data set available to be able to really assess any changes in performance. So they really focused their effort from that point forward on like how do we set ourselves up to be able to look at this next time around. So I'm getting through this way faster, which means we can have more of a conversation about it, which is awesome. Um, all right, so there were a couple of opportunities for future work that we have kind of identified from what really stuck out to us and that we're hoping to work on in the future if the NSF gods love us enough um, and give us lots and lots of money. So the collaborative process was like really valued and we really wanna know why. Because this is something like you can deliberately structure things, you can create little communities of practice, you can create peer support groups that help each other through working through like a process like this. There's social accountability wrapped up in that. Um, there's having other people think about your project and how it operates and they're gonna come at it differently from how you do in ways that like can open up some new possibilities. So we have some ideas about why we think this was useful to people, but we really need to actually ask directly and, and try to like establish structures that kind of replicate this feel um, in different ways and see if it still plays out as effectively for them. One of the biggest things and the most solvable things is we actually need that data on volunteer engagement and sometimes volunteer characteristics linked to the scientific data that the volunteers are contributing, preferably at the source. We need extra tables in the databases that summarize the stuff about the observers. Um, and this is where we're like, we pulled in Greg and we're like, come on, sit side folks, you are in a perfect position to help on this. And that's also where we would get a, like a value multiplier effect by making it available to so many other projects. So we're really hoping that if everything works out nicely, we might be able to actually roll some evaluation tools out that will help these project um, managers, you know, kind of level up what they're doing. Finally, there was a really interesting one that one of my co-authors loved, um, and this was one of those weird kind of things that happens when you have an interdisciplinary team. So we saw that these different projects that had different ages and different maturities were really getting a different level of value out of the work that they were doing. It was more profound and less profound, depending on where they were in the project evolution and, and their lifespan, right? And this is very logical. 
Well, it turns out software development has the concept of a capability maturity model, which I'm aware of because I come from the tech space. None of my co-authors had ever heard of this. And it basically says, as a project or an organization matures, they lock down various capabilities that let them improve their performance over time. And there's always usually multi-level and there's certain kinds of things that you use to classify how they're performing at these different levels. And this kind of model has been applied to things like data management capabilities as well. So people have taken this concept and run with it in a number of ways and we decided to follow suit because we really saw that the capabilities and the maturity of these projects had a lot to do with how much value they got out of it. And given how much they invested to do the work, even when we were paying them. So if we're not paying them, it'd be even more of a critical thing to be able to communicate to people what they can expect to get given where they are. Um, that, you know, for some projects, if you have optimized the bejeebers out of your project, like Coast, maybe you don't need to do this. It's only for intellectual curiosity at that point because you're really not gonna see gains. But for a like fresh new project, like the Front Range PICA project, they're actually gonna really benefit a ton um, because they're not so set in what they're doing. They've got some flexibility and some ability to adjust how they move forward in ways that put them into a better position to build this into the capabilities of the project moving forward. And so that's kind of like, they're really well positioned to do some cool stuff in the future as their data accumulates. So these are some of the things that we're hoping to work on um, just based on a whole lot of work with some lovely people over a few years. And so this is a fantastic grant team. Um, I am only a small part of this picture and we have some lovely collaborators if you ever see their papers, like definitely give a read because they've been doing some solid work. So thank you for your attention and for being here today. Fantastic talk, whoa. Um, fantastic <laughs> talk, Andrea, I loved it. And I'm um, curious about if there was any, especially in the interview data, mention to project agility and nimbleness. Mm -hmm. So like when we're implementing evaluations as described and we're starting to iteratively learn mm -hmm. about effective ways to improve our process, is there any indication that they have the agility and nimbleness to make those changes? That's my question. That is a fantastic question. This is why we need you on the team. Um, so I think some of that kind of falls into or overlaps with that capability maturity model sort of concept in that the less mature a project is, probably the more capable they are of spinning on a dime because they don't have as much infrastructure, as much baggage, as much data that they don't want to throw away um, that they can't just pivot a little bit and approach things differently. You get to 20 odd years of what you're doing and good luck changing that protocol. Nobody's gonna entertain that notion. You might be able to get other information and record things differently, but you're not gonna change the actual process of what the volunteers are doing because that would be way too disruptive at that stage. So I was struck, uh, thank you again, I liked your, I, I it was very informative. I'm, I was struck by the data that you presented from the alarm um, program in Pennsylvania where they found that people were, were um, less motivated by the science but more motivated by sort of um, their own perhaps political interests, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, was it a part of your study to to determine whether or not any of these organizations, when they um, shared the scientific results with their volunteers, if that affected their, their engagement and motivation to continue hmm. participating. Because I know that that is one of the, one of the concerns right. of, of citizen science efforts and endeavors, is maintaining the relationship with their volunteers long term so they don't have to train new ones yep, absolutely. And, and then they have the longevity of their data collection mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering what that relationship was if you know any know of it so in that project in particular um, so this forgive me my brain is a little tired at this point <laughs> um, uh, the specific kind of thing that you were asking about like the returning results to volunteers and stuff 
that was not really part of the picture that they were looking at because they actually hold community workshops to work with the volunteers to analyze the data. Um, so they're like really in deep in working with them on the results and making sure they're communicating appropriately. Um, I think there was a, a, like a related thing happening in that I don't think these volunteers actually cared about that. They had found some social group of people with shared interests and the imminent threat was no longer imminent by the time they decided to stop doing this monitoring. Um, and so it just wasn't kind of achieving all of the goals. Those folks could have had a coffee club and probably been just fine and gotten just as much out of it. Right? And so I think it's really interesting to think about when is it time to um, you know, sunset a project and shutter things and like try to say a, a graceful goodbye um, because it just they weren't getting the quality of data that they might need for any other purpose and they weren't seeing signs of the stuff that they were really concerned about. And so it seemed like, you know, with the resources they have, that's probably not where the sweet spot is at this point. Thanks, uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, well, I feel like I'm really loud. Um, I was struck by that finding, or that, yeah, that finding that like uh, a lot of these programs didn't think that, you know, changing the demographics of their participants was actionable. Um, do you think that that's true, or do you think that these particular programs, like, uh, it is actionable, but they maybe valued like data quality over that? And then, kind of a secondary question there being there seems to be this like perceived uh, trade-off between like data quality and participant, you know, how widely you recruit. Um, do you think that that's true or that's a real trade-off or like is that just a perception that you can actually get at both of those things? So to the second part, I think it is a perception and not necessarily true. I don't know how anybody's individual demographics would necessarily affect anything other than like maybe older birders don't hear the high-pitched calls, right? We know that happens actually, hearing loss. Right, so there is actually evidence of under detection of some species um, when you have older observers. But there's incredible bias on the part of the scientists towards people under 60 who are college educated, who have all of these characteristics, um, which is really interesting because that's not who is attracted to participate. So I think it wasn't actionable for them because the sustainable kind of recruitment retention that they were working with, like that would require an entirely different approach. And I don't think they felt like there was any fundamental reason that those demographics were something that was actually gonna really impact the data quality. So it's you know such a common covariate for anything that involves humans, but there's also a whole lot of trepidation in citizen science about asking for demographics at all. So we, we know that underrepresented um, populations are severely underrepresented in citizen science. Like we know that from what demographics we have, but people are really hesitant to ask because the more stuff you're asking for, the less you get. And so they would rather have people engage and not know anything about their background than potentially scare people off. So I think for them, the actionability is we really wanna just have everybody who wants to participate, participate. And probably they were just like, we're not overhauling our recruitment processes and unless there's something really major happening here and we don't think that that would probably be because of demographics. That's my guess on kind of what the rationale was. It's a great question. Thanks, Andrea, that was a great talk. Um, one of the things that struck me as I was looking at your framework, thinking about uh, the purpose and tasks and skills and applying it to citizen science. I was actually thinking, backing that up a little and maybe wondering about your thoughts about co-opting that for, um, it, in the academic setting, bringing graduate students who, you know, we assume, for example, oh, they know how to do this. How do we know how to do it until we've tried it, right? And so I'm wondering about that kind of framework for whether whether you're talking about recruiting, you know, undergraduates for mm -hmm. a particular task or bringing mm -hmm. in graduate students for transparency of these are the types of things that we're expecting. Have you have you thought about that? I have not, and I love this idea um, because we make a lot of assumptions about people's capabilities and some of the early kind of conversations that we had around what's a skill, what's not a skill, and we're like, well, you need to be able to operate a computer to do data entry. You need to be able to read, right? And these are all skills, and they're critical skills, and they're important, but are they science inquiry skills? 
well, that was an interesting conversation, but it kind of was neither here nor there because you don't have information on that if they don't have those skills, like they are not participating. In terms of like, are we actually teaching the right skills? One of the things that I didn't highlight here, but was kind of an interesting reflection um, from the project as a whole, including the other strategy, is that often we want people to succeed with things that we are not training them to do. And we are assuming. And so that's one of the reasons I kind of put this like, let's break it down into tiny little boxes as much as we can. Because um, I even had one layer further <laughs> originally, which is a little overkill. Um, because it's actually really important that we know what we're asking people to do if we want to set them up for success. And so I think you absolutely could, especially for like a research process in kind of an educational setting, say, okay, here's the protocol, here's the things we're asking you to do in order to do those right. You need to know how to do the pipetting properly. You need to know how to do like this dilution properly. You need to know all of these things. And I think it would make it much clearer for those of us who are blind to the complexity because we're so familiar with it, exactly how much stuff the new folks have to grasp to get there, right? Um, and that's one of the things I think we see very consistently with professional scientists who are working with the public is they have forgotten what they have learned and they have forgotten where they started from because they've been in it for a while. And so you don't have this, say, this kind of perspective on what it is that people are bringing to the table because you're just so used to it. Um, it's easy to forget. And so I think like being able to surface that more strategically could actually be really useful. I love this idea. Let's write a paper. <laughs> I'm only half joking. <laughs> I just had a really quick question, um, and I might have missed this, but was there any, were any of these projects involving volunteers, I guess it wouldn't be volunteers, but like compensated volunteers, and was there any data um, looking at like how the data collected by those individuals, there might have been some patterns compared to uncompensated volunteers? I would love to see that study. We did not have that kind of project in our sample. Um, I think, so one of the really interesting things is with the traditional volunteer population that we're usually able to draw from, one of the reasons it's a biased sample and not representative of the full population is you have to have the wealth to be able to spend your leisure time on science. And there's a lot of people for whom that's not the case, right? And so those are the people we would need to be compensating. However, for the people who can afford to do it, they may be insulted if you offer them compensation. So you can shut it down. Because I'm giving you the gift of my time and my interest. And if you try to pay me, like, you cannot afford my time, right? Like, seriously, you cannot afford my time. So, like, it's, it's kind of a catch-22. I think you would need to do an all or nothing on those kinds of setups or have a really specific kind of structure where, yeah, we have lots of people who are volunteering, but we also have this group of folks that we are kind of mentoring through participation and compensating them for it, like in an internship model or something like that. Right? I think you could pull it off if you framed it that way, and that would actually be pretty appropriate. Um, but we don't have that kind of analysis, and I would love to see it, because it would be really interesting. Um, my question is a little bit based off of Julian's. Um, so I know that Reef has the trips where they like pay to go on these trips and mm -hmm. participate. And so I'm wondering if the people who pay, physically pay to do this, if there's any difference in their data, or if that was just chalked up to group size. That is a fantastic question. I don't know if they actually looked at that specifically, or if like the group size is reflective of ability to pay. Um, I think the other factor there is like, I don't know how much it costs to do scuba diving. My guess is it's not cheap for anybody, right? So you already have to have a relatively wealthy kind of lifestyle to be able to do that for leisure in the first place and then being able to do a group trip. Like you've got to already be somewhere with coral reefs that you can dive to. So you've already probably paid for travel unless there are people who just happen to live in the area and do scuba diving. So I don't think they looked at that specifically, but it'd be kind of interesting to ask them if they thought about it. I love it. So I'm, I'm inspired by several of the last questions, but really thinking about Miko's question about um, you know, understanding the demographics. Mm -hmm. With the groups, the organizations that you studied, 
in your project. Mm -hmm. Do you know if the primary motivation of the citizen science program was to answer their own research questions, or was it really to sort of democratize science and engage the community and educate the community to promote civic engagement? Fantastic question. So these are, double checking here, yeah, these are all, with one exception, I think, very much the traditional top-down scientist organized, we have a science school, jump in and help us if you want to kind of project. I think Alarm is a little different um, because they are definitely responding to community concerns. And that's been part of their model since the start. But they've definitely got a focus. They've got some things that are more likely to be science-driven than community-driven. But actually, community-driven is their primary shtick. So yeah, uh, great question. I expect it would be completely different if they were all community-driven. That would be really fascinating. It turned out to be really, really hard to recruit any projects for participation that actually really meaningfully in, engage underrepresented communities. We really tried, and it was really difficult. Yeah, my only suggestion for that would be slow food movements in Chicago. That sounds fascinating. It's a, it's a really, yeah, there's a lot of really cool community projects for that. Um, my question was, knowing what you know now after doing all of these mm -hmm. huge analyses, if you were to start a citizen project, citizen science project from scratch, what would you do differently now? Oh, I love the questions, you guys. Um, <laughs> so I think one of the things I would do is I would make sure that I had a way to capture the kind of information that your you know, typical uh, volunteer management system would be um, recording, right? So these are like formalized software systems that if you've got the money you can pay for and do and that we would love to see built into sitsci.org, but not everybody's got those resources at the same time. You can have your own administrative records that you structure in a way to kind of capture that information routinely. If you use like say Sign Up Genius for people who are gonna to come to a training, then you've got some kind of a record with hopefully some kind of identifier that you can cross link somehow on the back end, and, and you're gonna have to do more work with lining up the data, but it would be less work because you could thoughtfully structure it to kind of reduce the load um, than if you kind of had to do it the way some of these projects did. So I would say like, capture whatever demographics you think might be meaningful at intake, and um, definitely keep records of who attends what kinds of trainings, um, what any kinds of engagement beyond the primary like engagement in doing the science. As much of that as you could keep tabs on in an appropriate way. And then also be real thoughtful about the ethics of working with that data for anything related to publication. So generally speaking, that kind of data is program management data that's used for program improvement and therefore exempt. You should still ask the IRB um, because sometimes it's kind of problematic not to, depending on what you're actually going to do with the data and which data you're using. Um, in terms of data protection, it shouldn't be the biggest problem, depending on how you've got things organized. So it's not like you're likely to spill confidential information that's going to like put somebody at risk. In most cases, I mean there might be some outlier situation, right? Um, but I think like being able to really know who your volunteers are in whatever structured way you possibly can, and how they've interacted with your program as well as you possibly can, would be really valuable. This also goes to another thing that anytime I've analyzed longitudinal data from a dynamic, living, ongoing project, there are events in that project's history that have potential to impact what you see in the data and there's almost never a record of it. And yet, I've done these analyses where it's like, well, something happened here that made your download spike. Do you know what it was? And they're like, no, we don't. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that was a training over there, and that was like a seminar over there, and that's why we had people downloading the software, but we don't know what happened with that one, right? Um, so if you actually keep records of some of these like meaningful events in a project's history, um, press, for example, if you get on like the BBC or on NPR or something like that, um, that can make an enormous impact 
on recruitment and do those volunteers stick around or not? Is that a, a, like marketing that you should pursue or not, right? You don't know it unless you kind of like keep track of these major events in the project history. And it's something that I've seen since like the very first projects I worked on as a doc student um, in open source software. Nobody keeps track of this stuff and yet it's actually sometimes critical for accurate data interpretation. So, excellent questions, I love it.